Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm just admitting everyone and letting everybody in. Um, but my name is Kelly Walsh and I am a Landcare um, Coordinator at Glenrack and Glen Innes. I'm hosting um, this webinar today uh, on behalf of the Southern New England Landcare. Um, just before I hand over to Stu and Ferguson, I would just like to do a tiny bit of housekeeping. So um, I'd just like for everyone to keep their um, videos on off and also on mute until we, we are going to go into some breakout rooms at some stage. So once you go into your breakout rooms, you can come off mute and turn your videos on. Um, and yeah, uh, what else have we got? Um, any questions? If you have any questions for our speakers during the webinar, just chuck them in the chat box and at the end of each speaker, we will go through and we'll answer all those questions for you. And also, um, no, I think that's about it. So we've still got some people coming in, but I will hand over to Struan. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions or you're having any trouble hearing anybody or you can't see, please just write it in the chat and I will try to get that fixed for you as quickly as I can. So um, yeah, without any further ado, I will hand over to Struan Ferguson. You're just on mute, Struan. Um, I'll start again. Um, welcome everyone to Silver Pasture 2021 Part 2, um, celebrating trees, pastures and biodiversity. So last week we heard from Rowan Reid on silver pasture and species selection, um, Scott Hall on successional agroforestry and Michael Taylor on harvesting. Um, uh, just a reminder of our calling question for this series is what do you see as the climate change challenges um, for species selection if we want success in revegetation and silver pasture? Um, we've allocated some time for questions and answers, which will take place after each speaker. And then we'll explore some key questions in breakaway groups. Um, um, Silver Pasture 2021 is supported by the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources through funding from the Australian Government's National Landcare Program. Um, we will ask you at the end to complete a survey monkey evaluation, if you would please do that for us. Um, I've sent out the link to everyone via the Sticky Tickets website. Your answers to this survey will help us report back to the federal government and help us improve future events like this and um, future events like this. Um, so speaking today is Nick Reid, and Nick is the Head of Ecosystem Management in the School of Environmental and Rural Science at the University of New England, Armadale, and co-author with David Norton of Nature and Farming, Sustaining Native Biodiversity in Agricultural Landscapes from CSIRO Publishing. And he'll be speaking on the benefits of biodiversity in solar pasture systems um, and possibly agriculture in a wider agricultural sphere. Um, so now I'll hand over to Nick. Thanks very much, Nick. Thank you, Struan, and um, welcome. Uh, sorry, thank you for inviting me to, um, to speak today. Um, it feels a bit strange. It's been a long time since um, I had the, an invitation from Southern New England Landcare and, and uh, the Taylors to, um, to participate in a, in a Landcare event. I've been sort of tucked away at the university for the last eight years um, in an administrative role. And so um, it feels like a bit of a coming out for me today. Um, <clears throat> I apologise uh, right from the start. I was going to give you a whiz bang video rich presentation, but um, the technology got the better of me. And in fact, it's taken me a very long time to get back into the swing of, of preparing a, a talk. So um, bear with me. I um, hope uh, it won't be too boring for you all. Now I'm going to try and share my screen and go to a PowerPoint. Can everyone see that? Um, yes, Nick, we can see that. I'm assuming that everyone can see that. Look, before I go on, um, I just, uh, it'd be remiss of me not to acknowledge country. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we are all meeting. And um, in my case, uh, I'm uh, on the land of the Anwan people 
I'd like to acknowledge their enduring, the enduring nature of the longest uh, continuous culture in the world. And I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to all indigenous participants that we might have in the meeting with us today. So I've been asked to speak about um, silvopasture, um, the, the benefits uh, to biodiversity of silvopasture, and also, as Struan mentioned, um, under a, a changing climate. Um, a lot of the work that um, I did in this space was actually done um, more than 10 years ago as part of Land, Water and Wool. And unfortunately, for those of you with long memories, um, I'm not sure that too much has changed, uh, at least in terms of the relationships between biodiversity benefits and uh, livestock profits uh, since that work was done. Um, silver pasture still is making a lot of dollars and cents. Um, silver pastoral farms, as far as I can see on the southern New, uh, northern tablelands, southern New England tablelands are, are resilient. They've survived the, um, the last and very severe drought and they're persisting. Um, they're very good for biodiversity, um, silver pasture farms and other ecosystem services like carbon sequestration. And um, a lot of grazing families in southern New England have a lot to be uh, proud of. Um, and we'll talk about that uh, as we go forward. There are some distressing um, uh, trends that um, have uh, that have uh, appeared um, more strongly in the last 10 to 15 years. Obviously, climate change is writ large now across Australia and across the globe, and we're suffering badly, as was predicted by the boffins, that Australia would be at the vanguard of suffering very badly from climate change, and we, we're witnessing that now. Um, the other thing that I'm distressed about is that we would have hoped 15 years ago that with all the work that was being done around the country that there would have been a more, a more positive and forward public policy response to the public good uh, work that so many farmers and graziers do across the country. Uh, unfortunately, um, there's not much evidence of that. Um, before we get going, let me just, um, let me just clarify what I'm talking about. When I mention silver, or when I say silver pasture, I'm talking about the integration of, of woody perennials, trees and shrubs in our case, but in different systems, they can be palms or any, any other form of, of uh, woody or semi-woody perennial, integrated with livestock grazing pasture, some sort of pasture. And there's got to be an ecological and economic interaction between the woody component on the one hand and the grazing system on the other. And of course, the reason we do this because, is because there are so many uh, advantages in having multiple products and services being generated by the same unit of land. So from the timber component, obviously food uh, or fiber and fodder and timber and fuel wood. And from the, um, again, from the uh, renewal point of view, uh, a range of services uh, such as and shelter or carbon sequestration or biodiversity enhancement. In fact, there are scores of these goods and services, ecosystem goods and services um, that are documented in the literature. We're also going to be talking about biodiversity and that's just the variety of life uh, on uh, across the planet and the ecological complexes that life forms. It's the diversity with and between species uh, and among ecosystems. And finally, we're going to be talking about goods and services, ecosystem goods and services. And ecosystem goods and services are simply the benefits that people obtain from um, uh, ecosystems. And we've mentioned goods such as food and fiber and timber and fuel, wood and drug. And there are a wide range of ecosystem services. Regulating services like shade and shelter or carbon sequestration. Cultural services such as aesthetic, recreational, spiritual or psychological well-being that people derive from um, uh, being in fantastic places across the planet and supporting services such as habitat for native uh, fauna and flora. 
Finally, um, climate change. By climate change, I simply mean any long-term shift in global or regional weather patterns uh, and the associated changes in oceans and land surfaces and ice sheets. And this um, term climate change often refers specifically to the rise in global temperatures from the mid 20th century to the present. Um, but as you can see from the graphs on the right, um, climate change has been going up and down for a very long time um, due to the glacials and the interglacials on uh, hundreds of thousands of years time frame. And down the bottom, the green uh, graph down the bottom over the last millennium, the, um, the depression in temperatures associated with the mini ice age um, is quite evident before um, we hit the J curve associated with the industrial revolution. So I guess the first question um, that we can ask is, does silvo pasture stack up? I'm gonna take a, a blatantly Southern New England focus here. Um, Michael invited um, me to, to um, talk to you about um, these questions um, and Michael at the Hill, um, Michael Taylor at the Hill, in Kentucky um, is uh, very much in Southern New England. Uh, and so my examples are going to be related and focused towards um, uh, the Southern Northern Tablelands. Um, parallel arguments can be made for other parts of the state country. Does silvo pasture stack up? So is it, I'm going to ask the question, is it profitable? Does it make farms more resilient? Um, what are the ecosystem service and biodiversity benefits of silvo pasture? Uh, and then how do we take into account climate change? And should we be thinking about planting different things in order to prepare for the future? And will silvo, silvo pasture still stack up? under a changed climate in 20, 30, 50 years time. So let's start off with the first question, does it stack up? Now this is a valid question because normally, although the total yield of a temperate silvo pasture system is greater than the sum of the two individual parts, when you look at the two individual components, they're usually not equal to each of the components by itself. In other words, if you have a a grazing system and you put trees into it, then the sum of the grazing system, the yield from the grazing system, the livestock outputs and the, the timber outputs is greater than um, either one or the other. But if you look at the individual components, the timber output is normally less than the timber output by itself without the grazing system. And the grazing outputs are normally less than the grazing system by itself. And if you look at the journal agroforestry systems, as I did yesterday, uh, for a very recent study of 22 studies of 22 temperate silvo pasture systems around the world, you get the results in the graphs um, in this slide. But that would tend to suggest since we don't, um, we don't uh, in New England, we don't tend to harvest the tree component and make a lot of money from it, that would tend to suggest that maybe we're not particularly interested in silvo pasture systems because we're taking a hit, arguably, on our grazing output by having trees in our system. But is that really the case? We did some work with John and Vicky Taylor at the Hill um, prior to Michael taking over a long time ago, 15 years ago, when John and Vicky was first pioneering whole paddock contour plantings. Um, I think that's a picture of their first paddock. I think it's top sugar loaf. Um, and um, they had been experimenting for long enough by the time that David Thompson, our uh, economist, and I got to John and Vicky. And we modelled the impact of um, vegetating, revegetating uh, re a whole paddock with double rows of radiata pine and native uh, eucalypts and, and acacias. And we, we listened very carefully to John's experience in terms of the adult sheep survival increase and the increased lambing he was getting from improved shelter in paddocks like Top Sugarloaf. And we, uh, David did some nice modelling over a 20 year time frame and showed that just due to the improvement in uh, due to shade and shelter from the improved 
um, cover of a uh, tree cover uh, across the paddocks that were sheltered by the plantings on this property that the improvement in the gross margin was about $11 per hectare and the net present value of the shelter was worth about $113 uh, a hectare to the tailors. And you can see in the graph uh, the nature of the, um, the nature of the relationships. And so shade and shelter is actually giving more than uh, from the trees than would be the case if there were no trees there, which is really positive. Uh, and a really good incentive for, for why one would invest in whole paddock contour plantings. And indeed, that's exactly what the owners have done. They've gone on and done whole paddock contour uh, plantings in several of their paddocks now at the hill. There's more data suggesting that windbreaks actually provide more to a grazing system than just the grazing system without the shelter. For instance, in uh, the mid 90s at uh, the University Property New Home, we had funds over a two year period to um, explore the impact of newly planted five year old, 10 year old um, windbreaks, native windbreaks on weather uh, wool production. Uh, and in the first year, and these were uh, Aristide and native pastures, not very nice pastures, but we started to fertilize them with superphosphate and then lime superphosphate. Um, over a, a three year period. And in the first year, we ran a, a constant stocking rate experiment uh, at very low um, stocking rate because of the, the nature of the pastures. Um, and we got a significant improvement in greasy fleece weight from the sheltered paddocks than the unsheltered paddocks. Year two, we decided that there wasn't much chop in, uh, in running a constant stocking rate experiment. So we changed to a variable stocking rate matching the stocking rate in each paddock to the uh, paddock's productivity. And there we found that the windbreak paddocks ran 42% higher stocking rate, 30, cut 32% more wool, cut finer wool, uh, believe it or not. And the wool income in dollars and cents was 55% higher in the, wind, in the sheltered paddocks than the unsheltered paddocks. So, uh, another windbreak study showing that shelter in southern New England gives you more than just um, the grazing system by itself in terms of returns. Is it just shade and shelter though, or is there something else going on? Is it just the, the, the improvement in terms of animal productivity and animal survival, or is there a pasture issue going on as well? Phoebe Barnes, one of our PhD students here, um, produced this work uh, out, at, um, out at Talimba, the university's feedlot, uh, in a uh, scattered uh, a paddock, a native pasture paddock with scattered uh, grey box across it. Um, and she followed the uh, grass production in uh, one of the, the main uh, paddocks at Talimba over the course of a year. And she produced these circles uh, circle plots and measured the the green growth response of the grass related to uh, underneath the tree in the immediate zone around the tree and um, further out away from the tree. And what it looked like when you just looked across the paddock was that the um, there was less grass all up. This is total dry biomass. There was less grass under the trees and less grass adjacent to the drip line of the canopy uh, and more grouse out in the open. But what Phoebe did was she put cages up. And um, what she found was in fact, the, um, the growth, which is the gray zone, the growth of green biomass was actually much greater under the trees and adjacent to the trees than it was uh, further out away from the trees. And similarly with uh, senescent biomass, um, the cattle were actually eating a lot more of the senescing biomass under the tree adjacent to the tree than they were out in the open. In other words, the pasture under the trees and adjacent to the trees was more nutritious and the cattle were targeting that than, they, than the pasture between the trees. So there's suggestions as well that there's a grass response to trees, more nutritious and greater biomass associated with shade and shelter, not just an animal response, but a pasture response as well. If we go further afield, and I'll explain later why I'm going west and north from the New England Tablelands. 
Uh, Sandy Walpole, Walpole's, um, published a study of about 28 mixed farms um, on the uh, slopes uh, near Gunnedah in nine, uh, uh, from a study of the output, the agricultural outputs of um, these 28 farms in 1992-93. And what she showed was that the gross value of pasture output was actually maximal uh, among these properties at about 34% cover of, of white box, white cypress, forest and woodland. In other words, the grazing, so each of the, each of the farms had uh, a, a proportion of cropping country, but were mainly pastoral properties. And uh, the properties that hit this sweet point of about 34% uh, remnant vegetation cover were actually producing the maximum amount of uh, grazing output of uh, gross value of pasture output. Uh, and so in areas slightly drier and to the west of here, we're seeing a similar sort of story that either due to animal and plant or plant uh, and or plant response, um, woody vegetation can be associated with improved uh, grazing outputs. Uh, now let's move north into southern central Queensland near Theodore into Brigolo country. Um, and here, QDPI, uh, back in the 2000s, uh, did a, uh, found properties where the owners had cleared um, alleys uh, and planted buffalo grass in between leaving a regrowth um, Brigolo strips for shade and shelter for their cattle um, on uh, heavy uh, clay soils. Um, and what the two-year study in 2004-2005 found was that there was, although there was reduced pasture production obviously in the Brigolo strip itself and immediately adjacent one tree height downwind, there was actually quite a long fetch downwind where there was increased pasture production in this system um, with uh, higher soil carbon and nitrogen associated with the pasture production close to the windbreak and increased soil invertebrate activity associated with the brigolo. And you can see that the, the cattle were taking the green uh, amount, leaving the brown uh, because fencing and exclosures were used to measure the, the production uh, with and without cattle in this experiment. Um, and you can see that the cattle were actually uh, eating more of the grass uh, close to the close to the brigolo uh, strips rather than out in the open where uh, they didn't eat very much grass at all in the first year and uh, not as much as close to the brigolo in the second year. What did the landholder think of, of this? This was the landholder's perspective that um, Greg McKeon and others um, wrote up. Despite highly variable rainfall and very dry conditions during 2001-2002, uh, seasons, noticeably different changes have occurred in soil organic matter, friability and moisture under and near the tree, the tree strips compared to the open paddock areas. For example, there's been a noticeable increase in gain to buffalo and mycosia, the legume. The effects of the tree strips tend to take, make the soil more friable due to the addition of organic matter and perhaps changes in biological activity. Stock seem to prefer the feed under the trees, 75% utilisation. Since the strips have developed, grazing pressures need to be more evenly spread across the paddock as the stock tend to move down between the strips. It works really well. The main purpose is for stock shelter. The strips also have beneficial effects on the soil bugs, birds and spiders, which aid production. In hindsight, the strips should probably run north to south instead of uh, southeast to northwest um, to prevent shading on the southern side. And they should be wider to be of benefit to wildlife. A good design would be a ratio of one third strips, 30 metres, to two thirds pasture, 60 metres. That's what the owner of Theodore, of Duke's Plain Theodore brought about his, his um, silvo pasture. So some local and regional silver pastures are clearly more productive in terms of pasture and livestock production than you would think and are certainly profitable. Are they resilient? I go to properties such as the Hill, Lana, East Lake, which were case studies, or I've had a lot to do with in the last 10 years, where trees are a really important part of the business plan of the grazing operation on each of those properties. They're quite different examples because uh, the Hill has focused on a lot of exotic planting in the uh, trees that they've put back onto um, that property 
Lana, of course, is uh, just uh, a native woodland ecosystem. And East Lake uh, has focused on both exotics and, uh, and natives as well, with enrichment of existing native vegetation in uh, some of the remnant stands of vegetation on that property. These are different examples of silver pasture farms, but they're still going strong. Um, and if persistence equals resilience, then these well-managed silvo pastures are resilient. That's the best I can come at. Uh, a, a, uh, a, an answer to the question, are our silvo pastures resilient? Um, a lot of local wool growers we found in lamb, water and wool uh, back 10, 15 years ago thought that silvo pasture was pretty important. We surveyed about um, 350 growers, wool growers in, uh, across the Northern Tablelands uh, in 2003. 77% of properties had some uh, bushland or tree cover uh, and the timber um, that, they were, that, uh, that they were grazing ran about half the sheep numbers and cut about half the wool of their uh, native and naturalised pastures on the same properties. The interesting thing about the survey was that when we asked um, these 350 wool growers about their tree cover, about half said that they had too little tree cover. And that group was planting over a thousand trees per farm per year. Mainly natives, some exotics, primarily for shade and shelter, but also for uh, ecosystem balance, natural pest control and for wildlife habitat. Uh, and 61%, over half of the properties had tree plantings. So wool growers obviously think that silver pasture is pretty important in the New England. Biodiversity benefits of silver pastures. Uh, we did quite a bit of work of this uh, on this in land, water and wool and uh, people like Andrew Huggett have been working with uh, Southern New England land care in the last 10 or 15 years and I'm sure finding pretty similar results. Basically, uh, if you add trees to a system, you'll get a lot more bird species and a lot more individual birds um, than just the straight pasture um, livestock system. And that graph there shows the impact of um, introducing uh, scattered trees in pasture or mixed plantings that introduced in native species um, or uh, native forest and woodland or, or wooded riparian. Um, habitats uh, on wool properties across southern New England and the impact on, on um, the diversity and the abundance of bird species, of bush bird species. The really interesting thing is that there are a whole lot of uh, declining woodland birds associated with wool properties on southern New England. All of those, those photos of bird species are what we call declining woodland birds that have suffered uh, drastic uh, reductions in their distribution and their abundance across the wheat sheep belt in southeastern Australia over the last uh, several decades due to habitat loss and, um, and predation. Uh, and the nice thing, of course, is that half of those 20 declining woodland bird species are found on our New England uh, wool growers' properties. There are also um, a lot of arboreal marsupials, particularly brush-tailed possums across um, wooded areas across our farms. Um, particularly brush-tailed possums, but also a fair number of koalas on many of our 22 monitor farms and smaller numbers of sugar gliders and ring-tailed possums. So um, native mammals as well, and including bats. Um, as soon as you put um, trees into a grazing system in southern New England, you get an increase in the diversity of bats that are associated with foraging for insects in and around trees. You might not get a particularly big increase in the number of species per, per, um, per survey period or the number of individuals per survey period, but you get an increase in the number of species uh, as soon as you put trees in the system, as the graph down the bottom shows. And we've got quite an array of, of, um, of bats uh, on our farms, about 11 species at least in our surveys back in the mid-2000s. Um, and what we've been able to show out in the cotton country in the last few years is that um, bats, all sorts of species of bats over cotton crops, 
um, moth specialists and they target uh, really important um, cotton uh, moth pests such as Helicoverpa or Heliosis um, and uh, clean up big uh, on uh, important pests as part of natural pest control. So we've been sort of mentioning as we've gone along the ecosystem goods and services that are derived from silvo pastures, from um, the biodiversity associated with silvo pastures. Um, Michael um, talked to us about sawn timber uh, and farm timber and the fact that he sells posts down to Tamworth for treatment, post treatment um, in the uh, initial thinnings from his pine plantations at the hill. Um, but of course, all of us no doubt use fuel wood off farms uh, and can use the, the rough native sawn timber for fencing in yards. In other systems, in other places, honey may be important if you have a friendly beekeeper. Uh, and of course, um, where stock can gain access to uh, fodder from trees and shrubs, that's what they'll do. In terms of regulating services, we've already talked quite a bit about shade and, and shelter. Um, what about carbon sequestration? Obviously, trees and woody perennials are great carbon sinks. And I just wanted to refer to um, some work that Michael um, commissioned from uh, at the Hill recently from Mark Gardner, his colleagues at Vanguard Business Services. Uh, they undertook a natural capital accounting report of the Hill. And what they found was really interesting uh, from, uh, I'm sure from Michael's point of view, that the uh, total emissions in tonnes of CO2 equivalent per year were about 1,000 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per year. And the estimated carbon sequestration from what is now about 18 to 19%, Michael told us last week, of woody vegetation cover across the hill, um, the estimated carbon sequestration um, of that uh, extensive timber bank is about 1,250 tonnes of CO2 equivalent per year, meaning that the hill is in a net um, sequesterer of carbon dioxide or carbon dioxide equivalents to the tune of about 250 tonnes of CO2 per equivalent per year, which is a really nice place to be. And if you think about the numbers um, and one of the points or one of the questions I was interested in getting Mark, uh, Michael's opinion on last week, and maybe he'll, he'll talk to us about it this week, is that I reckon if he's about, he's about um, 15 to 18% over and above, um, sequestering over and above the amount of carbon dioxide equivalent that he would need to be, to be carbon neutral, which means that the sweet point in terms of revegetating the hill, must be around 15 to 16% of the hill, I'm assuming, would be about the break even point where the farm goes from being a net emitter to a net sequestrer of carbon. But let's hear from Michael in due course. What are some of the other regulating services um, that we can expect from uh, silvo pastures? Water purification and nutrient entrapment, uh, the hill provided a beautiful example of this 15 years ago, uh, and it's continuing to be an example of this. Uh, John recognized uh, very early on that um, the, the creek that runs through the property in Long Frog and Junction paddocks needed a lot of, um, needed very special treatment in terms of grazing management uh, and in terms of the sorts of trees that could be planted along it in order to get some really great outcomes. And, um, really great outcomes that were evident 15 years ago and are still evident uh, and improving today are the filtration surface uh, that of uh, filtering out the sediments and the nutrients from overland and subsurface flow across the property. The, um, the dense pasture that's allowed to build up in the, in the creek paddocks and, um, and the trees, the dense belts of trees alongside the, the creek uh, slows flood water from um, upstream properties and pushes the flood waters out across the floodplain and deposits sediment from the, the flood waters from, uh, from neighboring properties out across the floodplain on the hill for free fertilizer. And there's been very dramatic uh, reversion of the inside drainage, drainage channels 
that were created as a result of storm events in the 1940s, John was telling me a couple of weeks ago, and reverting the, the creek to a chain of ponds and former drainage plant and drainage planes in between the ponds, um, which was probably the, the nature of the, um, the topography of the, of the drainage plane prior to the 1940s. The final regulating service I just wanted to talk briefly about, which I'd again be interested to hear uh, John and Vicky and Michael's thoughts about, is natural pest control. So I mentioned the fact that things like bats, native bats uh, in cotton country are really important in terms of mopping up um, uh, things like heliothus moths, where you've got habitat for them, so woodland habitat. Um, out on the, uh, the floodplains of the Namo and the Guaida, et cetera, in cotton country. But natural pest control might be in operation too across um, the tablelands and particularly at the hill. So the reason that John and Vicky began planting trees in the late seventies was, was because of New England dieback. They'd basically lost virtually what was a well-wooded property in the 1950s. They basically lost most of their native tree cover, almost all of their native tree cover and all of the woodland. Um, by the late 1970s. And John said it just didn't look right and started planting trees. And not surprisingly, started planting exotic trees in order to avoid um, what he later started to call little thrift because as soon as he started to, to, to try to put native uh, eucalypts back into the system, they got smashed by Christmas beetles every summer, as you can see in those photos. But what wasn't so evident in uh, 15 years ago in the mid 2000s, but is now quite evident to me, having sort of been away from the property for about 15 years and now looking at it um, afresh, is that over the 40 year period with the property now at about 18 to 90% tree, almost 20% tree cover, there are some really great outcomes now in terms of the, the remaining remnant trees and woodland stands that are left on the property. The trees canopies are healthy. Natural pest control, um, such as the scolide wasps, and you can see examples of the scolide wasps taking nectar from the Berserius bionosa there and, and going and finding mealy grubs and scarab beetles in the soil and, and parasitizing them. Um, it looks like natural pest, con pest control has been regained across the property because the, the remnant trees, the canopy is looking good. And there's natural regeneration starting to appear of the most sensitive, susceptible native species to New England dieback, New England peppermint and blackleaf red gum across the property. In other words, the mature canopies of the remnant trees must be healthy enough to be reproducing and throwing seed in order to get that natural regener regeneration happening, which wasn't evident 15 to 20 years ago. Uh, and obviously sheep grazing management has to be sympathetic to allow as well. So that's enough about the benefits of biodiversity and the ecosystem services that we, we get from climate change, uh, where we get from uh, silvopasture. But let's just quickly talk about climate change. What species should we be planting? Um, I think there's going to be a lot more said about this, but let me just throw some ideas around and we can talk, talk about them a little bit later on. Michael Drillsmer in, in DPIE um, here in, in, in Armadale published a report um, four or five years ago, five or six years ago, basically uh, mapping the um, climate-based groups of vegetation types across Southeastern Australia, where they are today and where they're going to be in 2050 as a result of their climatic uh, conditions uh, moving with projected climate change using the, um, the global models of, of climate change and changes in temperature and precipitation. This is, this is the, the map of the New England vegetation type by climatic class in 1990 on the left. By 2010, <clears throat> it's already suffering in terms of there not really being much environmental climatic envelope left for it. And by 2030, you can see that it's all but disappeared. Now this is using the most extreme climate projection, uh, MPI 8.5, um, but Everything that the climate scientists are telling us about the last 10 years is they have been shocked and surprised by the rapidity with which the predictions that they were making 20 years ago 
have come to pass not in 30 to 50 years time, but in the last 20 years. Things like Great Barrier Reef, coral bleaching and um, the, um, the violence of storms and the intensity of droughts and so on and so forth. So it may not be, and if you look at the CO2 concentrations, we are on a business as usual trajectory, trajectory heading towards two degrees by 2050, uh, over two degrees by 2050 increase. The really interesting thing is that if you look at the top graph here, that climate, that climatic class, 21 across the New England Tablelands disappears. There is no comparable, there will be no comparable climatic zone in Australia um, for that vegetation type to move to. Um, and what happens is that vegetation types uh, to the northwest on, in the Nandiwar bioregion on the northwest slopes and in southern Queensland and the southern central ranges of southern Queensland um, find that their climatic zone has shifted to the New England tablelands by 2050 using this climatic projection. So what does that mean in terms of species selection? First thing to say is that not all northern tablelands plant species are doomed. Lots of our native plant species and populations have very broad climatic tolerances and um, individual plant species and populations are not necessarily closely adapted to where they occur. When we, we can, people have done lots of experiments to show that in fact they often do better in another part of where they might not occur or another part of their distribution than the actual location where they occur. So it's not as if we're going to see mass, mass extinctions. However, <clears throat> clearly climate is going to shift and some of our species are going to start doing it tough. So the recommendation for northern tablelands tree planters, I would suggest, is that we need to be starting to think about trialling species collected to the north and the northwest of the northern tablelands in order to see how those species go, and particularly species which are common to those zones as well as uh, already here on the Northern Tablelands because potentially by mixing the gene pools um, we can get um, good adaptation to the non-elements that are going to, going to occur. So in terms of um, just summing up, I think silver pasture makes a lot of dollars and cents in southern New England. Everything I've seen would suggest that. And including to the north and northwest, such as the work at Gunnedah and the work at Theodore, which is the climatic zones that are going to occupy the northern tablelands in 2050 if we continue on a business as usual approach to climate change and CO2 emissions. And so it's heartening to know that those silver pastures should still be yielding well, um, even under quite a bit of climate change. Farms are actively managing silvo pasture. The farms that are actually actively managing silvo pastures are resilient. They've persisted um, with trees as a focus of their business plans over the last several decades and going strong. Silvo pasture in southern New England is certainly good for biodiversity and other ecosystem services like carbon sequestration. Um, grazing families practicing silvo pasture have an awful lot to be proud of, I think. Unfortunately, disruptive climate change seems set to continue and trialling provinces, provenances of native species from the northwest slopes and from southern Queensland, from the ranges in southern Queensland um, that are shared in particular with New England um, seems like a sensible way to go. Diversity is good. Uh, lots of different species makes a lot of sense in terms of the novel silver pasture systems that we might want to be creating. And unfortunately, I don't see much help from um, public policy at the moment in terms of incentivising the, the so many public good outcomes that we get from silvo pasture uh, in our part of the world. And it sort of makes me want to become an activist, a political activist around getting good change for, for uh, great landholders uh, in that space. Um, that's all I've got, um, Struan. So, um, uh, I'll call it quits there. Great, thank you very much. Um, um, fascinating. Um, I can't wait to see the 
um, your presentation again and take some detailed notes. So thanks for that. Um, so what we'll do now, everyone, is um, open it up to question and answers. We'll, we'll sort of allow five minutes um, for Q&A. We'll see how that goes. So if you're happy to type your um, the questions into the chat, um, then we can... Okay, so Deanna Furness has said, um, if we wanted to find our own areas on those climate change maps, where would we find them? Nick, are you able to answer that question? Yeah. Um, so the report is publicly available that I mentioned, and it's, sorry, it's in there in that, um, that reference um, list. Drillsma, this, um, this report is publicly available and there's a website with the um, species profiles um, of each of the 100 bioclimatic classes across southeastern Australia. Um, and um, I think if I give you that report, Struan, then people can yeah. come you and you go from there. I'll send out a resources list. Um, I'll compile a resources list from all of our speakers and um, that sort of thing and send it out with the recordings when they're available, which should be quite soon. So um, thank you. Does anyone um, else have a mess, um, question for Nick? Um, okay, so we might... Um, we might move on then if there's no questions for Nick. Um, okay, so we're going to, Kelly, are you there? Yep. Great, um, so you're ready to do this workshop. Um, you just ask the group three questions and um, you'll get a very sort of five to seven minutes to, dis, um, to discuss each question in a group, in a breakaway group. So it's pretty quick. Um, you'll be randomly assigned and then um, once you're in the group, just introduce yourself and then choose a scribe. Um, uh, have your chat box open to the right so you can, um, one person from each group to write the answers in. Um, you'll get one minute warning when it's time for the breakaway groups to shut down and then you'll come back to the main room. And so we'll repeat this process after each speaker. Um, so the first question is, um, what stood out for you? Um, so what stood out for you in Nick's talk, or even you could refer to something we saw last week, um, but um, that's the question. Um, so are you happy to put everyone in breakaway groups, please? Excellent.
So, um, welcome back, everyone. Are you with us, Kelly? Yep. Yep, great. So, um, does anyone want to share um, some of the things that stood out for their group? No? Okay. So, We'll move on to our next speaker. Um, I'd like to introduce, um, is everyone back in the room? Yeah. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Andrew Gardner, um, who's going to speak to us on um, seed collection. Um, Andrew works in seed collection and um, seed database management. Um, and as a research technician at um, Fields Environmental Solutions in Urella. Um, Fields specialises in large-scale ecological restoration. Um, thanks very much, Andrew. Thanks, Rulin, and um, thanks for all the organisers, Michael and Southern New England Land Care, and um, thanks for the opportunity to present here today. Um, I'll give you a brief background of, of our business and how we sort of got into the seed area. Um, some, of, some of you may know Steve Field or Ben Field um, from Urala. We They 
place started out nearly 30 years ago as a, as a plant growing native nursery and evolved into contract tree planting, which sort of went along and got bigger and bigger and until we um, got into sort of larger scale ecological restoration. And through that and through some LLS projects, we became aware of um, the opportunities and I suppose the, um, uh, the benefits of collecting seed and the, the shortage there is in, in seed supply currently in this area, especially. So um, probably about seven or eight years ago, we, we started getting into seed and we're lucky enough to engage uh, Dr. Lorena Ruiz Talonia um, through UNE to, to do some of our seed research and seed testing um, here on site in our lab. Um, so that, that's a bit of a background to where we are. And I'll, I suppose I'll try and link that to um, silver pasture and climate change management um, and talk to you a bit about the opportunities um, of the seed industry and you know, potential for the future for landholders. So um, ecological restoration um, for our part, that means um, full veg community restoration projects. So whether it be augmenting existing remnant up to a certain standard or, or starting from scratch, rebuilding entire vegetation community. So, so it's a bit, um, bit of a step up from, from standard tree planting, I suppose, in that we, we're dealing with the full strata. So right from canopy species, um, all your woody, woody shrubs down to forbs and herb layer and the grass layer. So um, we really focused on this when we started doing a bit of work for, for some of the mining sector around Gunnedah and, and their uh, regulations changed oh, about, about 10 years ago to really focus on biodiversity rather than simply just putting X amount of whatever native back on their place, they really had to match uh, the remnant and, and get that full strata um, up to a certain level. So suddenly we were dealing with things like eucalypts and acacias and some of your basics um, now having to grow and plant and work with dozens of species on the same job. So uh, when we got into this type of work, we realised there's, there's um, a lot of species you simply can't source the seed on the market and no research has been done on a lot of these, so they're very hard to grow. So we, we decided to, to uh, take that path of actually collecting the seed um, ourselves and, and it's, yeah, this is, it's been a great part of our journey. We've, we've enjoyed getting into seed and and we can see some real potential for the future. So um, the applications of this, I'll, I'll just hint on this and I'll, I'll come back to this at the end. Um, when uh, Nick talked a lot about biodiversity in tree plantings and how um, this brings about resilience in a system and, and I won't go too much into that because Nick, Nick covered that quite well, but um, there is a, I suppose, if you're doing a tree planting, an environmental tree planting project, there's some considerations on this path um, as to how you may initially establish a tree line, but then augment that with, with more biodiversity to um, build your resilience as, you, as your tree lines establish. Um, the, the evidence is fairly clear now that having a a wider range of species can tackle um, different climactic events. And um, that's, that's definitely a consideration if someone's thinking about any sort of environmental planting is to um, consider um, how to build that biodiversity and therefore build resilience on, on farm. Um, the, other, the other opportunity, I suppose, is the native seed industry itself, which 
is um, is going to boom. People are booming already, but we'll will increase this. This sector is probably going to be regulated soon, and, and the demand for high quality native seed is is quite large. So there is potential for landholders to actually build a seed bank um, on their property through their management practices and actually make money from, from selling seed and that sort of thing. So um, I'll, go, I'll go over some of our seed collection techniques. Um, we don't have too long to talk about it, so I'll be fairly brief. Um, the main the main thing that sets us apart from some of the other guys is our data collection. So when we collect a batch of seed in the field, we we will record everything about that seed, and soil type, number of plants, um, number of plants in the community, the, the community itself, um, GPS details, and we record it on site in this might be a bit hard to read, but that's that's sort of the amount of information that will go with any single collection of seed, um, which travels with that seed. It's basically a birth certificate giving that seed provenance and therefore high value for an environmental planting. Um, we we do all of our seed collection under flora bank guidelines, which is basically a, a set of guidelines for ethical seed collection so it's very important that any seed collected uh, doesn't damage the, the sustainability or the future of that area that you're collecting from so that's a big big issue at the moment and um, part of the regulation is is trying to avoid bad practice in seed collection at the moment um, harvesting itself uh, still very basic. It's, there's a lot of equipment. I'll show you the things that we use after years of collection. There's probably three things we use. A set of gloves. There are secretaires. And your humble plastic tub. So most types of seed you're gathering by hand um, or, or simple, simple tools because um, we don't want to cut down whole trees just to get a bit of seed. So we, um, seed collection is accessible by anyone, but um, it's very physical, physical hard work, but simple. Um, the difficulty with seed collection is knowing enough to know what you're collecting and making sure that you're collecting ripe seed, not harming the tree and not spreading weeds around the place by misidentifying or, or um, mixing seed batches and that sort of thing. So, so it's simple, but you have to be very particular in dealing with seed um, to maintain its uh, value, I suppose. So, so um, if we went on a seed collection trip, we would collect um, seed from a range of species. Um, put it in bags, bring it home, and the first thing you do is dry the seed out. So, a bit hard to show you. I've got a, this is a bit of a eucalypt ranch. So I've just sat it on the tarp for a couple of days and um, probably hard to see, but the seed is now coming out. Um, we dry, most seed material will come, come out of its pod or carrier through drying. Um, and also we need, when we're dealing with seed, you need to store it between um, five and 10% humidity um, to prolong its life in storage. So, so um, after collection, seed is dried. Um, we, do, we do all our seed cleaning and processing on site as well. And that's, um, that's probably, where it gets a bit more complicated and expensive and takes a lot of space because we're not just dealing with acacias and eucalypts, we're now dealing with hundreds of different species and um, each of them requires different techniques to separate from its pod or its chaff and get down to pure seed. Now, a quick example here, this is, this is you know, 
can see it, um, a Petosporum angustifolium. You can see the red part, it look, kind of looks like a brain. That's actually a group of seeds. So, so this is probably what we've come home with after collecting it. Um, it's been dried out, so these pods are now open. But in order to get clean seed, which is, well, that's, that's pretty close to clean. Um, what I have to do is separate the twigs and leaves and then put, put all of this material uh, in a bucket, mix it around and actually wash the seed out. And then I have to dry it a second time and then put it through an aspirator. So um, a machine that separates using air um, material by weight to get the last of the leaf out and eventually I've got something that's clean enough to, um, to bag up and, and store. So all of our seed, we, we try to get as close to pure as possible. Um, so yeah, it's basically um, uh, as, as pure as possible because um, we sell to the likes of nurseries and um, people like that who, who require um, very, very pure material to put through their machines and grow the seedlings. Um, another thing that we do in-house at our lab, at uh, Lorena um, looks after this, is seed testing. So everything we collect um, is tested. Um, so basically we end up getting uh, results for how, how pure the seed is. So uh, what percentage of, of seed there is um, compared to chaff or trash. And then viability. So whether the seed um, has a live organic material. And um, finally germinability, which is what this test in the petri dish is doing so we've we've placed a known amount of seeds and um, after a, a set time we count how many germinants and that that will give you a percentage of how um, how germinable that seed is so, so we're aiming to get quality seed here because that um, that means if we're using really high quality seed we can use less of it in the projects and um, that's basically one way that we can um, regulate the sustainability of wild harvest is um, trying to um, use techniques to get the highest quality of seed so that we're not using tons and tons of stuff that's um, not been tested or, or is full of, full of trash or you know, not viable for, for another reason. Um, we, Lorena does a lot of R&D here in our lab. So some of the things we're working on is um, checking different seed dormancies. So Lorena um, is actually presenting a paper up in Darwin at a conference on, um, on sort of 40 difficult to grow species from the Gunnedah area and, and uh, some of the seed dormancies that she's discovered within those. So uh, things like uh, physical dormancies where you might have to crack an outer coating for that seed to then germinate or uh, physiological dormancies like um, needing a stratification period in order to unlock that seed and, and help it to germinate. So with some of this research, again, it's helping to make as many seeds as we can winners in, the, in their end use. But, um, we, we also, have a seed coating um, machine. So when you're looking at native grasses, most of you probably know there's, there's sort of two, two categories of native grass. You've either got really fluffy stuff like this, like your bluegrass and your red grass, or you've got stuff with a big awn. And neither of those is easy to spread or use in any way. Imagine trying to put this out of a machine and that lump that just fell there is probably worth 20 bucks. So it's very expensive to use. So we, we look at coating, coating our seeds and turning it into something like this. That will then run through, you know, a 
machines that are on the market and, and potentially um, turn native pastures into a, an affordable and, and usable thing to replace even, even by landholders. So, so that's, that's another opportunity, I suppose, is um, we know the benefits of native pastures and their drought resilience um, compared to some of the exotics. So if we can come up with techniques of, um, of reintroducing native mixed pastures um, into landscapes, um, there could be a potential for a lot of um, farmers to, to make the switch to to a pasture type that, that will handle um, some of what climate change will throw at them. Um, so another viewing of seed, we, we also keep all our seed um, in a seed bank. So it's basically a, a refrigerated container. We, we store our, all our seed in, um, in uh, vacuum sealed bags. So that's it. Uh, five to ten percent humidity it's sealed off and it's kept in a fridge below 10 degrees and a lot of seeds will will last um, you know 10 20 years stored in those conditions so, so there's a fair bit of um, fair bit of work and infrastructure involved in um, in a seed operation like us um, but there is there is potential, I suppose, for people to get into the seed market in the future. Um, so growing, growing native pastures is highly valuable. If, if, if you can provide relatively weed-free native pastures um, for harvest, that could be a, a real money maker into the future because the demand is, is quite large. So it's a consideration to manage parts of a pro property for um, seed sale being an end use. So, um, we, we actually have a, a custom built machine. Steve built a, a trailable grass harvester. So it, it trails beside a four wheel drive and, and actually sucks up um, grass seed quite cleanly. So, um, so that, that's, that's a good potential there. And the other the other thing that is coming in um, into focus is um, biodiversity offsets. So, um, being, having um, having a vegetation community that ticks all the boxes to be um, part of that classification um, vegetation community um, that could actually be quite a good earner as well into the future because. Any sort of land disturbance now has to offset that, and um, people that are trying to buy remnant properties to offset construction or mining are finding it harder and harder to find enough land. So, so there is a potential um, if you can um, do environmental plantings with the mind of um, including enough biodiversity and keeping it weed free to then tick the box of being um, a particular vegetation community. That, that's another you know, potential source of income and, and obviously having, having um, more trees, more biodiversity on properties will, will flow on with the benefits that, that we've heard um, the other speakers talk about. So that's probably, I've probably done my 10 minutes by now. So. Thank you all, and um, any questions, far away. Thanks, Andrew. Does anyone have any questions? Um, if you can type them in the chat, um, that'd be great. Um, okay, well, um, we might cut to our second workshop question. Um, so once again, we'll go into breakout rooms, um, introduce yourself. Um, oh, Michael Taylor's got a question of, um, um, Andrew, what sort of prices are we talking for native grass pastures? So, um, so for a, a per kilogram rate, 
the cheapest native grasses on the market are probably about $300 a kilogram. And that's um, environmentally sourced seed. So they're, they're very expensive, as you can imagine. But when we're talking about coating, if we can coat something to 100% or 200% of that bulk, you then give each seed a better opportunity and it's probably going to drag that price down nearly to nearly a third of that price. So it might be, might be $120 per kilo for something that's been um, coated and it will also perform better because it has that, um, it's easier to spread and it, and it has that um, protection inbuilt so it will germinate when the conditions are right. Mm -hmm. Um, thanks. Um, we've got a question from Kevin Harding. Um, do native pasture grass seeds get predated by ants as small eucalypt seeds are? And does coating deter this predation? Um, um, yes, yes to both. Um, ant, ants will take a lot, not as much as um, some species eucalypts. They tend to squirrel away and, and a lot of other shrub species, but um, They'll eat some of the grass, probably not in a noticeable amount, but once you've got a coat on it, um, they're less likely to, to eat that seed. Um, any other questions? Okay, um, from Kath Caddy. Um, how do mines or other organisations needing offsets go about finding places which tick the boxes? Um, a lot of the ones we've worked for have sort of got in early and, and they tend to purchase property in the vicinity of the mine that, that has um, uh, analog or you know remnant that does match what they're after. But um, I've, there's a lot of mines around Canada that have bought properties around Manila and Baraba that still uh, fit the, the veg community. But um, it's one of those sort of things, watch this space, who knows what will happen and, and with the models that Nick was showing and the, how um, climate change will push some of those Western species, there might be opportunity um, for landholders up here to provide offsets. Um, but there are, there's also um, the solar companies that, and construction, they have to offset as well. So there's some of that happening around here. Um, so there is potential, but you do have to uh, tick the right boxes to, to classify your area as the right type of um, vegetation community. And I'm not quite sure what that involves. Thanks, Andrew. Um, any other questions? Um... We'll just wait a minute. Sometimes it takes a couple of minutes to type into the chat box. Um, okay, we might go to our breakout rooms. So the next question for our breakout rooms is, um, what do you see as the climate change challenges um, for species selection if we want success in revegetation and silver pasture. So, um, Kelly, are you happy to put people into breakout rooms for us? Thank you.
Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, so um, next up we have um, Chris Everly um, is going to talk to us about planting techniques. So um, Chris and Maria Everly have been running um, the Kentucky Tree Nursery for 35 years, supplying native plants for the New England area. Um, Kentucky Tree Nursery is one of many nurseries um, in the local area providing native plants. And um, Chris says that one of the highlights of working in this area is meeting landholders who have a passion for the environment and planting trees. So welcome, Chris. Thank you, Strawn. And hello, everybody. Um, thanks very much for inviting me to participate, Michael and uh, everybody else. Uh, just a little bit of preamble to start with. Um, we came here to Kentucky about 40 years ago. We had a little house on a hill. It was uh, an incredible environment to, to live in. There was no trees, there was nothing around. And my wife, Maria, she was the main stay to uh, get trees and shrubs and everything planting around our house so that we could live a little bit more comfortably. And she continues to do this, which is um, a wonderful thing to do. And, um, and now we live in a pretty nice environment um, aesthetically, and there's a great amount of biodiversity and shade and shelter for us. So um, we've continued to um, be involved in the land care and we've planted our own trees on our own property and have really reaped the benefits of um, protection for our, uh, our for our animals, for our pastures, for the biodiversity that um, we get from planting native trees and shrubs. So I'd just uh, like everyone to bear in mind that at this stage, um, you know, I'm just talking about native trees and shrubs, native plants. So um, I do have to make a big shout out to John and Vicky Taylor who really right at the beginning or nearly you know uh, 30 odd years ago saw the need for for mass planting on the tablelands to to make a definite effect on the environment and so um, they were the ones that um, got involved with uh, bringing out the HICO tray system of, of planting plus all the infrastructure relating to to um, irrigation and um, painting equipment. So, you know, they really have um, made a big difference to how nurseries have undertaken the, the job of um, producing a lot of plants that um, people can take onto their properties and uh, with ease um, get the job done. So I've got my cheat notes here, everybody. Um, recently, there was a group of um, government girls came up from Walka. They wanted to put on a, a land a, a field day for landholders about planting trees and to do mainly native trees, really. That's what we're talking about. Um, and so the question was really, you know, how hard can it be to plant a tree? All you do is dig a hole, put a tree in the ground. Simple as that. But um, we're, if we're talking about large scale planting, it's probably a little bit more different to that. Um, we, what we're on about and what um, um, Rowan Reed talked about right last week was to do with um, following the land, um, cultivating the, the land, and um, making the job of planting a lot easier for the, for the landholder. So um, just looking at the planting tools that, um, that uh, we've uh, been involved with, and I just want to point out that we've only been involved with hand planting. So my uh, weapon of preference is, is known as, uh, I call it the John Taylor, um, plug planter, it, it's been manufactured and designed so that um, it fits exactly the size of your 
your tree plug that you put in the ground. So uh, that's the, my choice of, uh, of my preference for planting. Um, I've asked you many, many times, you know, how do you how do you make these things? And um, like he refuses to tell me, but um, that's another story. Uh, obviously, the, this is a, a, rep, a, a copy of uh, the Hamilton of, of John's machine, the Hamilton um, Ico planter. Uh, when we get into uh, soft going for planting, the every, you know the um, this is the potty putty, and it's a case of pushing the potty putty into the ground dropping your tree down into the, into the soil that's prepared for, for planting. Um, on odd occasions, I've used one of these for planting trees. So that's not very often, but sometimes you come into the end of a row or something and you need to use your drill and your, uh, to plant a tree. Alternative, the last one is your planting um, spade and of course that can work very well as well okay so um so i'm just going to go on to just a few examples of where we've planted uh, uh, trees and the differences that people have um, done to prepare their their land to, for planting so just outside Urala, for instance, um, uh, an area of land, 250 hectares, uh, we planted um, around um, 30,000 native plants, which were half trees and half shrubs. And um, that was all prepared with um, uh, mounding and um, ripping and rotary hoeing. This is probably five or six years ago. And now if you go and have a look in that area, it's quite an amazing um, area of land where all the trees, uh, most of the trees looking fantastic. So that was a well-prepared area of land, but you know they've been through the real dry times and they've still they've come out the other end and taken advantage of um, the current situations where we've got a lot more uh, good rain and um, into the future. Uh, another situation, we planted 20,000 trees up at Ebor. Now that's on uh, basalt country and <clears throat> the preparation there was a, a round up in strips of land within a fenced in area. The, uh, the rip line was done the day before we, we planted, which was quite an incredible thing to do. And uh, we went there and as we all know in Ebor, they do get a lot of good rain. And so that was another great situation where those plants um, survived and um, went on pretty well. Um, so that was that, that situation. And then just recently uh, around Walker, there was a, a chap had uh, a hectare of land that um, uh, which, uh, which he'd fenced 100 metres by 100 metres. Uh, he had 28 strips of, uh, that had been, um, the bulldozer had ripped, but that was five or six years ago. He, all those, it was all still in evidence that the effect that he'd done, um, but obviously in the time that, uh, that uh, since he did the, he was preparing to plant his trees, uh, the weather and everything got in the way. So we, that was all delayed. But anyway, this year he decided to get cracking, get into it. So I went and had a look. We decided to just re-round up the, the, the ripped areas of, of that were there, 28 strips, and we planted uh, 680 trees, native trees. Um, half were, were eucalypts, half were shrubs. Um, 
and quite a variety. And I was able to help, he was able to help me with that job. And he got a lot of pleasure out of doing that in the day. And, and we planted as soon as it rained, um, basically the next day it, it rained. So there was, the ground was just right for, for planting using the, the plug planter. So that was a good, a good uh, outcome. And then yesterday, a chap from Nowndock turned up, get his thousand trees. He's, um, he's got all his area ready to, to plant, all prepared. It, uh, use of, of Roundup, um, cultivated the area. Now he was to um, take his trees home and they were going to be planted with a machine, uh, drill, which was towed behind the tractor. Um, there wasn't to be any guards to be used. He'd had the rain. So there was no need to water in after planting, and he was quite happy to do that. So that was another variation to the to um, planting techniques. Um, so to repeat, um, following with glyphosate is very very essential. Cultivating, ripping, mounding, but firming in if there's any sort of gaps underneath very important um, and then the planting job can be done easily and uh, you, don't have, you don't need machinery you can just do it yourself and it's quite it's not a worry in the world. So for Maria and myself it is um, the main one of the main th important things for us has been the people we've met the differences in their enterprises the pleasures that they've got in uh, having successful, successfully planted their trees uh, over the years. And um, so that's been a great result for, for them and um, pleasure for us as well. Um, last three items on the list, really. I do like the um, motto of the Armadale Tree Group, and that is every tree counts. We all know what that means. Um, as a nurse, the second point really is as a nursery, we need to know in advance, and this applies to all nurseries, we need to know in advance of uh, any orders or anything uh, what is required. So, for instance, we plant our seeds, we sow our seeds in December, and then those trees, which are these ones here, for instance, are ready to plant in the autumn and they go right through to the winter uh, and, and, the, and the spring, the coming spring. So uh, it's vital that um, anybody that wants to do it, planting on their properties, that they let their nurseries know what they want. Um, and lastly, um, keep talking and learning from one another. And uh, as Gordon said last week, um, uh, more action. So thank you all. Uh, Thanks, thank Chris. You. Thanks, Chris. Uh, that's great. Um, so I have got um, the first questions come in for you, Chris. Um, what is the frost risk for planting at Noandock? Um, well, this, this particular person lives down off the top of Down Dock. So as you go down past the, the plantations of Radiata, so he's down the bottom. So that I'm sure the, there's plenty of frost. Uh, all I can say is that in our nursery, our plants are open to the elements as much as possible. Um, if there is going to be a cold, frosty night, we do, as you can see, there's plastic on the ground, we will pull the plastic over. But, uh, you know, the frost risk at Neandock is the same as it is here. Yeah. Um, thank you, Chris. Does anyone else have any questions for Chris?
I was going to say that uh, while we're thinking of questions, that um, you can plant, you know, as soon as you get ready to plant. So as soon as you've done all your preparation, as soon as you've done all your fallowing and you've collected moisture in the subsoil and, you know, there's an opportunity comes with, you know, a fall of rain, a good fall of rain, that's a great time to, to put your plants in. I've got a I've got a question, Chris. Um, I'm here with I'm here with Chris Struan. <laughs> um, yeah, what what would you uh, say is the, the 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 most important thing about um, choosing your time to plant? You're talking about having a fallow period, but and and being ready. But what what is uh, is it is it wise to plant when you haven't had rain or should you should you always be waiting for for that rain and um yeah i think if you if you're prepared reasonably well in advance you have had you know, a, a good fallow maybe you haven't had a lot of rain um surprising the number of of situations where we've planted in you know very dry situations and we've been gone you know immediately after planting it's a thorough watering in and that can uh, that can keep your your native plants going without any worries whatsoever so there's plenty of opportunities there's plenty of times when people have planted in the dry times and it's worked perfectly well and would you say that partly comes down to the quality of the seedlings as well um yeah the quality of the seedlings is important and so people that uh, want to plant should take advantage for, of the seedlings from their nursery that are um you know um, of good quality put it that way that means that they have been for instance these, these ones, that, that's a plant that shows you the potential of a seedling that was sown as seed in uh, December. So, okay. Um, okay, so from the point of view of the nurserymen, all the nurseries, it's important to know what we're doing uh, in terms of providing the right type of seedlings for into the future, keeping in mind climate change. Now, for instance, we have got uh, 70 different species in the, in the nursery of varying types of eucalypts, including ones from the off into the slopes. So the um, our planting customers need to try and select what they think is going to be good into the future. Um, thank you very much. Um, does anyone else have any questions for Chris? Here we go. Um, if anyone um, oh, has on the call hasn't done much tree planting, do you want to emphasize stomping the tree seedling in to eliminate any air pockets around the root system? Um, um, Kevin says, if you're too gentle, many trees will die. Right, yeah, that's true. So in your preparation to start with, it's important that if the ground is cultivated and loose to start with, or a rip line has been produced that creates a trench or is, is if, you know, the ground is too soft. Uh, I do recommend that um, people firm in that rip line so that you are mm -hmm. planting into a firm area to start with. And um, bear in mind that using the, the plug planter, you're taking out a, a, a plug of soil uh, into a firm planting area and um, that should take account of, um, of what, what you're talking about. 
Um, we've got another a question from Kath, um, Caddy. Um, will you or are you changing the species you grow as the climate changes? Well, Kath, I haven't um, really done much as I, uh, I've got a wide variety of, of plants in the nursery that come from, you know, Uh, Michael, it looks like we've lost Chris. Um, Trees are grown naturally up on the, on the table, and they seem to be. Are you able to swap to me? Yep. Yeah, go, go, Chris. <laughs> um, you get that, Kath? No, uh, you'll, you'll have to repeat the last bit, Chris. Okay, so um, as I say, I haven't really at this stage changed or to you know different species off the off the table lens. But as I said before, we do grow a lot of species that are, you know, in on off the western areas as well as onto the table lens. And there's an opportunity there for, for tree planters to select what they want. So that's most important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I have I I do um, collect my own seed. I do purchase seed from the uh, CSIRO Australian T Tree Seed Centre. I do receive seed from uh, the local land services in, in Burrell. And I imagine some of that seed there is collected by, uh, you know, those higher quality collectors that, that Andrew was talking about. Maybe some of his seed as I've sown and people are planting that. Um, locally in their, you know, the trees in their paddocks as well. So um, at this stage, uh, you know, the trees are going pretty well, I think. Did you get that, Struan? Yep, we did. Nice, loud and clear. So that's good. Um, thank you, Chris. We might move on to our breakaway rooms and our third um, key question, if you're happy with that. Um, okay. Um, great, thank you. So um, the question three is, um, what do you now um, feel confident to try or change? So we'll put you into breakaway rooms and um, there we go. Hello, uh, you're muted still, Struan. Sorry. Uh... <laughs> Sorry, Michael, I um, pressed the wrong button there. So I'm not meant to be in a breakaway room, but do you want to tell me what, um, <laughs> what, uh, oh, hey, what do you now feel confident to try or change? Um, I probably uh, consider native seed, um, <laughs> native, a native seed nursery again, <laughs> after hearing oh. you talk. <laughs> Well, so, it's, it's wide variety is the thing, isn't it? Uh, it is. <laughs> um, yeah, oh, that's great. You've, so you've got something out of it, which is really good. Um, 
Yeah. Uh, it's great yeah. seeing great seeing Nick's uh, Nick's talk again. Oh, wasn't that amazing? Um, oh, there was just a lot in that really. I'm really looking forward to going back over it and just really yeah. absorbing that. What he it'd be great to do another land water wool project like so well, many years that. on. Like <laughs> he's been that? talking about it. Oh, great. Well, maybe we should try and get that up um, because I think, you know, it's that probably a, some of the messages would be the same, but I reckon it'd be interesting to see what's changed mm -hmm. in that time. Um, but congratulations on your carbon sequestration. I think that's worth celebrating. Yes, um, I think that's really amazing. You'll be able, do you use... Can you use it as a marketing tool? Oh. Uh, potentially, but <laughs> it could also be um, <clears throat> could also be argued that that's um, that's uh, production that we're not we're not using as well. So <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I guess, I guess it depends on the, the point of view you want to take and, and the returns you can get on it. Whether you can get more out of it in production uh you know on farm or whether you can yeah. um, get get uh well potentially you know if the market's going to mm. to increase for offsets for for biodiversity and carbon stored on farm uh, maybe uh yeah maybe there, there'll be more more out of that maybe a, a more passive form of income um yeah, really, really depends on what happens. But the the most interesting thing about that came out of that report was that um, a significant amount of the carbon uh, storage was in trees rather than in soil carbon in pastures. Yeah, that's you know, yeah, that's right. Um, that was that was the the biggest the biggest thing that stuck out for me. <clears throat> Okay, I think everyone's starting or starting to come back now. Or Hamish has ended up, or is it Kath has ended up back in um, in our room? Um, it's a little bit clunky this technology. So um, Hey Kelly, is everyone back from the breakaway, the breakout rooms? Yeah. Um, some of them are. They've still got another ten seconds. Oh, okay. No worries. Great. They're all back. Great. Thanks, Kelly. Um, okay. Well, look, thank you um, very much, everyone, um, for a very rewarding um, couple of webinars. Um, I'd like to thank Kelly Walsh from Glenrack for hosting 
this two-part webinar series and Karen Zirkler from Snell um, helping with the facilitating. Um, Karen couldn't be with us today. Um, thank you, Michael Taylor, um, for partnering with us and speaking um, and being a key driver behind this event. Um, thank you very much um, to all the speakers. Rowan, thank you. Um, Nick Greed, thank you very much. Scott Hall, um, Andrew, um, thank you. And Chris Everly, um, we very much appreciate your contributions. Um, finally, thank you to the Department of Agriculture and Water Resources and the Australian Federal Government for funding this project. Um, and um, I'll put up I'll share a page which has got the link on it, but you will have received our SurveyMonkey link um, by email. So um, that would be um, great if you could um, you could fill that out for us. Um, and um, I just wanted to sort of wish you all um, all the best for your endeavours in this space um, in the future. Um, thank you very much and. Um, Kelly will just um, close off in a minute. So thank you. Bye-bye.